I'd actually like to start by getting people familiar with your argument for effective altruism and our responsibility to limit global poverty. And because I think it's just such a useful foundation, at least for me, I'm wondering if you'll describe your famous shallow pond analogy. Yeah, sure. This goes back uh, quite a long way. In fact, one of the first articles that I wrote uh, was about whether we living in affluent countries uh, have moral obligations to help people in great need. Uh, I wrote this at the time of a, a crisis in uh, what was then East Pakistan, but is now Bangladesh, when there were nine million people who were refugees who'd flooded into India to escape uh, the repression of the Pakistani army. Mm. Uh, and I was living in England at the time, and although there was uh, were some appeals for people to help the refugees, uh, there was very little that was actually going to them. And that raised a question in my mind as to, well, is it okay for us to just go on living our comfortable lives while other people are in danger of starving or dying from lack of proper sanitation and shelter? Mm. Uh, and uh, it occurred to me that the situation uh, could perhaps be represented in a, a more familiar example uh, closer to home. Uh, that is of, of the need to rescue a small child who had fallen into a pond and was in danger of drowning. And so I asked readers to imagine that they were walking across a park, uh, that there was a pond in the park, that they knew that the pond was a shallow one that they could wade into with that no risk to themselves. Um, but that they, had, they noticed that a small child had fallen into the pond and the child was too small to, to wade out of the pond. Uh, and so, of course, the first thing you would do is you would expect that somebody else would be around looking after the child and that they would jump into the pond and rescue the child. Mm -hmm. But imagine that you can't see anyone there. You don't understand how this small child got away from whoever was looking after him or her, but that's what happened. Um, so the next thing you think about is, well, I better rush in and save the child. But then you realize that uh, you're on your way to a very important occasion and you've put on your very best and most expensive shoes and other clothes, and they're going to get ruined if you jump into the mud muddy pond. And of course, there'll be some inconvenience. You'll have to go home, get changed, you'll be wet. Um, you might be late for what you're planning. Uh, still, um, would those be reasons why you could just walk on past the child and leave the child to drown? And I think uh, everyone really would say no. Um, they are not sufficient reasons. The fact that you'll be up for some expense in replacing your clothes, that there'll be some inconvenience to you, uh, those are not anything comparable to the life of a child. And so, of course, you should be prepared to sacrifice those things to save the life of this child, even though you're not responsible for the child's situation, even though the child is not your child, you have no special obligations to that child because of the child being placed in your care or anything like that. Mm. So if, um, if people agree with that, then they've in fact agreed that we do have responsibilities to strangers. Uh, we do have an obligation to help them if we can do so at a minor sacrifice to ourselves, a sacrifice that's not in any way comparable to what the child would lose. Uh, and uh, I then asked people to think about uh, if you agree that it would be wrong, not just not very nice, but actually wrong to walk past the child and leave the child to drown, then what can you say about our conduct if we know that we can save the lives of children in developing countries? Uh, we know that we can do that at a not very significant cost to us, something that won't be greatly more expensive than replacing the, the clothes in, in the example. Uh, and yet we, we do nothing about it. Um, isn't that also then wrong? Hmm. Uh, and I think it is. I, I consider various uh, possible disanalogies, of course. There are, no analogy is perfect and there are some disanalogies between the child in the pond and our situation regarding uh, people in extreme poverty elsewhere in the world. But I, I think on, on further reflection, none of these disanalogies really show that we don't have obligations to help children who are in danger of starving or dying from other causes, preventable causes.
business in uh, countries much poorer than our own. Well, in the interest of time, we can we can forget people who will say they have no obligation to save the child. And I don't need to get into too much detail, but maybe what do you think are the most serious objections to your idea about the drowning child example, and how would you respond to those? Most of the objections uh, point to psychological differences between the situation, mm -hmm. such as uh, we can see the child in front of us, we know that it's this child, um, we uh, have only one child to save. Uh, and uh, in the case of global poverty, of course, uh, we can't see the child, we don't have an identifiable child, and uh, even after we've saved this child, there are more children that we, or one child, there are more children that we should save. Uh, and I, I accept that those do make a psychological difference to how we feel about the two situations. But that, I think, is the result of a kind of uh, evolutionary inheritance from having lived in small face-to-face -face societies mm. where we evolved a, uh, an immediate response to people in need whom we could see, but we didn't evolve any kind of response to people we can't see because we couldn't really even help them for most of human existence. Mm. Uh, and I don't think that that's really very relevant morally. Uh, the other major uh, objection that often comes up is a factual one. Can I know that uh, my donation, if I donate to a non-government organization that's helping children in developing countries, can I really know that my money will do what I want it to do? Can I know that it won't all somehow be swallowed up in uh, the bureaucracy of the organization? Uh, and I think that's a serious question, and uh, but it's one now that I think has a clear answer. Uh, because we have seen the development of uh, independent research organizations, you might say uh, auditing organizations, that uh, examine charities, uh, examine how they spend their money, and actually, in the case of the best of these organizations, uh, look at studies in the field of the impact that they're having. So um, we can know with a very high degree of confidence now that if you donate to a charity recommended by, say, uh, GiveWell, which people can find at GiveWell.org, or The Life You Can Save at TheLifeYouCanSave.org, um, those charities have been uh, checked and uh, you can have a high degree of confidence that your donation will be very well used to save lives or help people generally improve the lives uh, of people in developing countries. So I think that uh, factual objection is one that can be met. I think that's perfectly logically consistent. Thank you.